good morning, everybody. I'm Margaret Heffernan. I'm a professor of practice here at the University of Bath School of Management. I've led five businesses, that's the practice part, and I write books and articles about how businesses work or sometimes how they don't work. And I'm really delighted to be kicking off the third series of our Dean's webinar with um, two amazing people. The is Victoria Jardin, Vice President of Marketing for Kraft Heinz EMEA. And the second is Simon Rowlings, founder of Canned Wines, a new business launched in, wait for it, January 2020. I'll be interviewing them for about half hour and then I'll turn to your questions. So please do post your questions in the Q&A and I'll try to get to as many as we have time for. Now, on the face of it, these two businesses could not be more different. Like Kraft Heinz is a global behemoth with plenty of resources and market clout. Canned Wines is a tiny startup now with two employees based here in Bath. But look more carefully, and they have quite a lot in common, a driving sense of purpose and the shared agony of dealing with disrupted supply chains huge changes in popular taste and the climate crisis from which no company is immune. So Victoria, I'd like to come to you first and ask, over the last 18 months, the short-term volatility and challenges have been pretty obvious, I think, for all of us to see. Most recently, the supply chain disruption has been a new demon to deal with. So how far has the sheer heft of Kraft Heinz given you advantages here? Thanks, Margaret. I, I think for any company, um, the ability to think forward um, and be very flexible um, is something in Kraft Heinz. We talk about the, the value of ownership. And I think that's really stood us in good stead um, through the duration of the pandemic. Um, people will talk about um, fight, flight or freeze. Um, absolutely, as we saw at the beginnings of the pandemic, um, our supply chain and logistics and procurement colleagues um, really, I think, understood um, because we saw some of the changes in our China supply chain. So we saw um, that kind of supply and demand shifting between our in-home businesses and our, our food service businesses. Um, and we, we looked to use that market intelligence to then help manage some of the forecasting and understand what we could do in our other markets in, in Europe, for example, um, through to Latin America. Um, that being said, with all companies, um, with the supply and demand, usually going through patterns, right? Soup sells more in the winter. We understand the, um, the consumption of our sources businesses, for example, um, the changes that we saw in consumer behavior whether that was the stockpiling of a lot of our meals businesses at home or um, that shift, as I said, from out of home to in home, um, we couldn't have anticipated the levels of differences in consumption patterns that we saw. What we were able to do um, for a company of our size is act pretty swiftly um, to manage that supply chain base to minimize, in some cases, our assortment. Mm -hmm. So to ramp up capacity of some of our most beloved lines. Um, I think in a pandemic, most consumers we saw turned to brands or products they knew they trusted. Um, in our case, with the leading positions we have across many countries in the world, that meant they, they turned to us. So our ability then to continue to supply um, by bringing that discipline and that expertise in our supply chain operations to bear, um, I really think did stand us in good stead. All right. I mean, it's, it's easy to see the short-term disruption, um, but I wonder what are some of the really long-term trends that Kraft Heinz has been dealing with? I think there is a number of macro trends, which in some ways the pandemic has exacerbated, but, but they continue. Um, if you think about the population growth, um, the forecast suggests an extra 2 billion people will be living on the planet um, by 2050. Um, that has enormous implications, not just within the food industry and supply chain, but you know how we live our lives as consumers. So 
whether that's water water shortage and the um, the water that we'll need um, for production, um, we would require the land mass additional land mass of twice the size of India if we were to continue with the current food production systems that we have to feed that population. And of course, the the materials and the resources that are used within the food production are also used within the wider ecosystem. So we definitely see this, um, this sustainable uh, challenge for the planet, if you will, um, that will continue. We see the age of um, the global populations rising. So, you know, how to live longer um, and live well. Um, food increasingly will be seen as medicine in many ways. The personalization of food is likely to continue um, to really address kind of health issues or health deficits with consumers around the world. Um, we also see, interestingly, immigration and emigration changing how consumers consume and what they consume. Um, so whether that's kind of the global trends within more hot and spicy foods or certain base um, ingredients. So grains from Africa, for example, becoming increasingly more common in Western diets. Um, what consumers eat and how they eat um, is, is changing rapidly. And then the, the technological changes that we're seeing, um, what do I mean by that? So you know, plant-based, as many of us know, um, has has reached the tipping point in, in many ways due to technolo technological advances. So how to replicate not only the taste, but the texture um, of foodstuffs so that consumers are willing and able to make plant-based um, replica substitutes as part of their meals, for example, or um, the advances in how we produce food. So hydroponics, which is essentially farming um, without the need for, for land um, or vertical farming. So all of these macro trends we're seeing coming through um, set to continue with that kind of acceleration in some instances due to people um, changing their behaviors during the pandemic um, wanting to be healthier in some ways. Um, but for those of us in marketing, and I'm sure Margaret yourself will know, you know, behavior change is very expensive, right? So if you want to try and change consumers' behavior anyway, um, it usually tends to be a slow burn and very expensive. In some ways, the pandemic has pushed that behavior change that, you know, after nearly two years for many consumers um, living and, and um, behaving in ways that perhaps they weren't um, looking to, to do before the pandemic, um, that we definitely see as a kind of catalyst for some of those longer term trends absolutely yeah that's very interesting i mean i have to say speaking for myself not being on planes the whole time radically changed my diet um only for the good <laughs> i have to say absolutely <laughs> so you know that, that's quite a long list of of things to be thinking about right po population growth aging population technical changes, immigration, migration, climate crisis, and the rise of plant-based food. You know, that's quite enough for one job. I wonder in the midst of all that, and with the pandemic layered on top of it, what do you focus on? You know, how far does this shift what you have to think about in terms of governance and priorities and so on? I think in the short term, as, as the pandemic hit, um, being responsible for for our brands um, and and really ensuring that for the you know the hundreds of millions of consumers that we serve, we make affordable, nutritious, everyday foods. Whether that be meals, whether that be accompaniments accompaniments to meals, um, and that immediate focus for us was how do we ensure that consumers continue to be able to find and buy the products that they want from us that they trust in um, uh, and that was really the focus so it was driving um, conversations around how we can continue to supply mm -hmm. um, it was around uh, the simplification of portfolios again to be right. able to meet those additional demands and, and really think about how we could maximize our capacity um, and interestingly a, a small story we had people writing in um, and the kinds of foods we sell in markets like the UK 
um, uh, tinned spaghetti, for example, with the biggest, um, uh, the biggest fresh pasta manufacturer in the UK. So the spaghetti that goes in our tins is, is fresh, it's made um, specifically for us. And people write in saying, I have a child um, who um, has a, a medical condition. Um, I, I believe it was autism in this instance. The only thing they will eat is four things, including this, this special tin of pies um, that we can't find anywhere in the shops. And so whether that was ensuring that supermarket shelves were filled, whether that was literally going and identifying and having our care line send bundles to in this instance you know a child that absolutely considered this one of their kind of everyday <laughs> meal staples mm -hmm. um that was very much the focus in in the short term as we're seeing that that pandemic um you know people talk about the new normal i'm not sure <laughs> not sure if we're in the new normal yet but you know two okay. years in we're we're kind of living with different circumstances different dynamics um, the challenge for us now remains um, innovating to meet, you know, consumers' needs, how we think about building our brands um, with quality of product that is available where consumers are consuming, um, when they and how they would like to consume it. So whether that's thinking more about e-com, um, direct-to-consumer offerings, understanding where we're likely to see the consumption patterns from in-home and out-of-home shift for us actually one of the things that we needed to track was what countries would be opening up to tourism and when because if you can imagine for our, for our food service and um, businesses um some of those big kind of peaks and the forecasting of when we would see um certain countries have that influx of tourism um and therefore you know consumption of western sources an example as those countries weren't opening up those were the things that um, were, were kind of keeping us awake. But interestingly now, it's how to think more about kind of predictive analytics. So mm -hmm. that forecasting in some ways and that understanding of consumption patterns um, becomes a little bit um, easier to navigate, if you will. Yeah. And as consumers get a lot more interested in where their food comes from, how it was produced, the working conditions, the environmental impact, you know, all of that stuff gets layered on top of this year, kind of the mechanical issues of getting the right food to the right places in the right time. Um, how much do you have to focus, maybe even more than ever, on maintaining or building trust between your consumers and your brands? My, my personal view is um, it is something that you need to do as part of how you think about being a good corporate citizen. Um, in many ways, Henry J. Hines was a, a pioneer in this space. So he pioneered something called the Pure Foods Act. So this was ensuring a consistent product quality um, for the masses, which at the time, um, you know, reassurance and quality standards within within food was not common with, and we're talking, you know, over a hundred years ago. Um, but that kind of pioneering spirit in um, ensuring that um, the way we like to think about it in Craft Hands is taste, absolutely. You know, consumers absolutely demand taste. Um, ensuring the right nutritionals. So whether that's a full meal or as part of a meal. So taste, nutrition and planet. How can you continue to ensure that the products that you're making, that you're serving to consumers across the world are done in a, in a sustainable way. Um, there's quite a lot of conversation at the moment around kind of brand purpose or ESG. I, I think of ESG, so environmental social governance as almost the kind of the enabler, the, the underpinning that I believe you absolutely needs to have as a responsible and reputable business now it may be that you choose to talk about some of those things in a way that is interesting to your consumers um, so particularly when you think about food um, the quality of ingredients and the, the sustainability of ingredients tends to ladder to taste credentials um, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing you do. It may be the thing that you talk about, but that wider ESG piece, um, in my view, is absolutely critical. Yeah. 
Yeah. And do you think that demand on the part of consumers uh, will keep growing? Um, I do. And I think that um, it's a space that with so much information and so much transparency across our lives so easily at hand um, digitally, right. um, I think at the moment um, it can be quite hard. If I think of myself as a consumer, um, what do I understand about some of the decisions I make? Um, I have yeah. two kids and I found myself the other day looking at a tag on some clothing I was going to buy and kind of going oh I <laughs> there's some kind of recycled good for you cotton in here okay <laughs> um they both look pretty they're both functional and that was something that I didn't fully understand right. but absolutely it was something that I thought well given the choice of both I'll decide for the one that feels like it's doing a little bit more right but that's challenging because without um, that kind of metric of what really is good, you know, is it is right. it food miles? Because something could be grown local, lo local. It could be closer to to where you are. Mm. But if it's a food stuff that requires to be grown inside with a lot of energy, because you know the climate is not conducive to growing that, then actually, if you looked at the carbon footprint of it, it might actually be worse. Yeah. for the environment at large, but the air miles might be less. And so I think as consumers become more sophisticated in this space, um, and when you see kind of industry bodies or even governmental regulation in, in many instances, putting in those those parameters, those, those ways to kind of put metrics behind it, right. that understanding that education of consumers and and the expectation they have, I think will continue to grow. But yeah. absolutely, if you ask consumers today, will they make purchase decisions based on um, companies they believe are doing good, um, then inevitably they'll say yes, whether they fully understand some of those complex <laughs> supply chains and decisions they make it, I think that's probably less clear, but we're, we're absolutely heading in that direction. Yeah, great, thanks. I'd like to turn now to Simon. Um, Simon, yours is a pretty amazing story, starting a wine company with a very, very specific environmental purpose. I wonder if just to kick off, if you could tell the story of how and why you felt compelled to start canned wines. Yeah, um, well, wine's a very interesting industry. It's a very historical one uh, and actually has shaped a lot of global supply chains if you look back at the history of it. So it's very interesting uh, space but it has in many ways not not innovated uh, in terms of packaging in the same way that other industries have and particularly if you look at other alcohol industries and beer and and, uh, and spirits it doesn't have that same level of uh, adoption due to tradition and, and all sorts of things but to put some some stats out there there's about 1.66 billion bottles of wine uh, drunk in the UK each year about 600 million of those are thrown away in waste and you could save about 750,000 tonnes of carbon uh, emissions by adopting alternative packaging, whether that is cans or bag in box or keg. Um, and the vast majority of wine is produced to be drunk uh, young and very, very uh, quickly after it's produced. So very little wine is actually uh, made to be laid down for long periods of time and benefit from bottle aging. Um, so when you start to look at those things, you start to question why Wine uh, is in glass bottles, it smashes, it's very heavy, it's difficult to move around. You have to add a lot of packaging for direct to consumer uh, sales when you're sending uh, wines through uh, the courier system. Everyone knows and has seen stories of um, logistics companies drop kicking boxes over uh, the garden fence and things like that. So you have to really look after glass bottles, um, which you don't have to do so much with, with other packaging. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of set about launching uh, Can Wine Co after going to a music festival uh, in, in 2019 when they were a thing. Um, and uh, the wine option there was poured from a glass bottle into a single use plastic cup. The whole festival had glass banned so no one could bring anything in. Uh, and that's true, I think, of most music festivals now. Um, and this was very, very expensive. And it was a very kind of environmentally poor way of, of serving 
wine and it was a, a case of kind of thinking really we can do something better here um, and then going home and having a conversation with with my fiance around wanting to have a nice glass of wine but not wanting to open a bottle uh, not wanting to throw a third of it away that last glass or the flip side which is drink too much um, and it was you know these few things that, that came together and, and really kick-started uh, Cal Wine Co. Wow so look what happens when you go to a music festival right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's hard enough you know, to launch a new consumer brand and doing so in a pandemic, which obviously isn't what you thought you'd find yourself doing, but is what you found yourself doing, must have made it a lot harder. How did you get through those first 18 months? Um, I think the, the interesting uh, thing for us is we had nothing to compare it to. So everything that we did, uh, was new and every sale that we made was was an improvement on before so we didn't have like craft Heinz the previous year to look at and and suddenly panic that everything has changed and how do we cope um what it meant was is that we had to uh, adapt and adapt very quickly so our strategy originally was all about events as you might imagine um it yeah. was about uh, going into trade and, and the vast majority of trade and particularly on trade closed down for uh, nine of the 12 months in the first uh, 12 months of the business. So we had to start to look at direct to consumer straight away. Um, we had to, to go to uh, retail because retail remained open. So our whole kind of marketing plan changed. Um, but what we did do was focus on, on quality. We focused on building the brand. Um, uh, Victoria mentioned it about uh, behavior change is, is a slow burn and, and actually adopting alternative formats in cans is a very slow burn. It's been going for a few hundred years. Um, <laughs> so we, we did that and we just, just took a, a kind of a slower approach. Um, and to some extent, I think that there was more forgiveness and, and room for, for consumers to kind of, particularly locally as well, uh, to adopt a new business and help someone and support them. Uh, and, you know, we didn't have to do everything perfectly straight away. There was, you know, that element of, uh, you know, trying to support local, understanding that it's a new business and we launched in a difficult time. So in some ways it was quite a, it was almost a free year to, um, to, to experiment and play, which I think if we'd launched into normal circumstances, we would have had higher expectations of what could be achieved. Um, so in many ways it was, it, it was good. Obviously we didn't achieve what we set out to achieve in our first year. We were quite a long way off that, um, but it allowed us more time to learn and more time to uh, kind of put the the foundations in place to to springboard uh, in this year, really since April when when you know uh, restrictions started to ease in the UK. Yeah, no, it's quite interesting. I mean, it's quite a long history of you know downturns being quite a good time to launch new companies, new brands, just because most companies aren't doing it right. So there's yeah. actually a lack of novelty in the market. Everybody's hunkering down. So um, it often can mean, you know, people cut you a bit more slack, give you a little bit more support than perhaps they would in a really, you know, hot and busy time. Um, I know that, of course, it's, you know, it's, it's important for you to get into supermarkets. Um, how difficult or easy has that been? Because I know that's a real uh, kind of gating factor for most retail food brands. Uh, well, we haven't got into one yet. So <laughs> um, it, it, uh, it's an interesting one, actually, because getting into supermarkets is um, it's often what, what people aim for. And obviously, we'd be delighted if we if we could get there, but we're not rushing to get there. Uh, we know that the working capital requirement to do that and also the logistics of delivering that is, is very tricky um, for, for what is a, a small team um, at, at the moment. Um, that being said, I think, you know, it's 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 something that we want to do and that we will aim to do over the next uh, 18 months, two years, you know, however long it takes. But I think there needs to be a shift in the way in which supermarkets view alternative packaging, um, how, you know, uh, the environmental impact of, of different packaging types and products uh, has an effect. Because at the moment, there's a lot, a lot of lack of knowledge, as Victoria said, around um, you know what this decision versus this decision means because there are trade-offs in in everything that you do um it's one of the reasons why we're not um we're not certified organic even though some of our wines are organic um but a good example with this is with organic farming particularly in wine uh heavy metals are used as sprays which degrade soil 
and uh, the, the, the vines have to be farmed more frequently, which compacts soil. So the soil quality in organic farming is actually lower than in non-organic far farming. So just leading with organic doesn't necessarily mean that it's better for the environment or that it's better for uh, the way in which the, the plants are grown and looked after. So it's a very difficult, um, you know, as you say, set of decisions that you have to make in, in, in everything. And uh, consumers becoming more knowledgeable in that area will only help to kind of promote canned wines and, and other formats as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a smaller player, has the has that made things with supply chains easier or harder for you, do you think? How has that played out for canned wines? I think it's been um, harder, particularly um, early this, earlier this year. So we, we've done a couple of imports this year, um, as in uh, at different times, uh, but across multiple wines. And certainly the one earlier this year, uh, which was around spring, so April, May sort of time, uh, it was very, very difficult to get the wine into the country. And we, were, we had wine, uh, which we, we ship in bulk into the UK, and then we can it locally. So uh, that reduces emissions. And it, 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 we basically produce the products in the market that we're selling it in. Um, we were constantly being pushed back on ships, shipments coming out of Spain, France, uh, because supermarkets were being prioritized. It was ensuring that supermarket shelves were full. Um, and we have, uh, or we had at the time, three lines. We have five now. Um, someone's uh, rosé not being delivered from Provence, if you're Sainsbury's, is probably less of an issue than one of our wines not being delivered because you've got five other options for a right. Provence rosé. Um, so it's a huge, huge impact for us, um, ensuring that, that that actually gets there and that it isn't uh, compromised in the process because it's not a finished product. We're not shipping the finished product. Um, so there's more more areas for things to go wrong, more more ways in which the wine can spoil, and, and obviously we don't want that to happen. So right. yeah, definitely a big challenge. Yeah, and yet despite all those challenges, obstacles, um, when I talked to you last week, you just secured investment. What, ex what difference do you think that's going to make to the next few years of your business? Very good question. <laughs> the first thing we're going to do is pretend that we haven't got the investment. Um, and hold on to the cash because uh, it's very easy I think uh, to get carried away particularly with direct to consumer marketing and, and Facebook is a, a, a never-ending pit where you can spend right. money if you want to uh, so we're going to invest in staff that's going to give us the opportunity to um, streamline our, our, our supply chain increase the size of our sales team uh, and just give us more of a, a, a footprint and, and ability to do things uh, better than we've done it so far um, and, uh, and start to move towards kind of bigger tenders is what we're looking to do really. So, um, you know, working directly with companies to help uh, either extend our lines or, or, or create things for them. Yeah, great. So we've got one question from the audience for both of you really, what are the key risks in the food supply chain? And, you know, where can, can you plan for resilience? Victoria, if I can ask you first and then I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, Simon. Um, I think at the moment we're seeing going into next year risks on um, the crop yields and so commodity pressure um, really coming from um, some of those climate change dynamics that we've talked about and so that's a cost risk for us. Um, we're certainly seeing the impact that um, you know the very well uh, written about shipping global uh, challenges are having um, and then certainly within the UK um, the haulage shortage is causing quite some challenges for us. Um, I think the other thing when it comes to food is food is incredibly local in many ways so other industries um, beauty for example tends to be um, a lot more globalized um, certainly not ubiquitous but um, in some ways it's easier to manage global brands and global supply chains because your your product base can be moved between different countries when it comes to food it's a lot it's a lot more local and mm -hmm. so then being able to anticipate and serve much more local palate um, is absolutely key and that brings its own challenges with supply chain you know if there's shortages can you move product from country a to country b um, 
I think the risk of not being able to move fast enough, um, certainly um, food has, you know, a huge number of very small, um, very entrepreneurial and innovative startups. And, and Simon, your, your company sounds fantastic, right? With a real understanding of not only what consumers and wine connoisseurs want, but a, an understanding of how wine is produced, et cetera. So um, when you're big, in some ways, the, the, the only way is not to lose. And so mm -hmm. when you're locked into capital, when you're locked into positions that um, gives you that sense of scale and advantage, not being able to understand those small trends and those small things that could potentially turn into something huge. I mean, plant-based, you know, if you'd spoken to many people in the food industry five years ago, in the mainstream food industry, it was considered incredibly niche, incredibly difficult, um, yeah. probably not something that would be adopted by the masses. And yet, mm -hmm. um, just yesterday I was watching TV and one of the biggest retailers in the UK is talking about Harvsies, I think it was the campaign, which was switching out half of your meat for some kind of pulses yeah. um, or substitutes. Now, when you start seeing those kind of changes added to that, you know, new technology, right? Um, those are the kind of risk scenarios that I, I don't think it's a, a risk from a kind of industry at large perspective, but certainly if you're a large player, you do need to understand where that where that industry shakeup could come from, um, because it may not be where you anticipate it will it will come from. Um, together with the with the shorter term kind of commodity freight um, um, crop yield changes. Right. right. Yeah. No, I mean it's interesting. I hadn't, I think, quite appreciated the degree to which you know, public taste can turn food into a, a fashion industry as much as the fashion industry, right? And we've certainly seen that in the really big changes in consumption and preferences. Yep. S Simon, um, I mean, it seems to me that one way you're planning for resilience is you have investment that you're not going to burn through in the next five minutes. So that's one way of thinking about resilience. Um, you know, I think often for entrepreneurs also, there's a big issue of personal resilience, you know, that, um, you know, how do you keep going when <clears throat> life has been throwing so much at you that was A, unpredictable and B, really pretty awful? Uh, I, I mean, that is um, probably the hardest thing of launching, launching your own business. I think uh, most recently, uh, including with with the investment actually just decision making fatigue has been the thing that's really got to me yeah. it's uh, everything is a decision all the time and everything is new so you don't really know whether you're making the right decision or not but you have to make one uh, so that, that's really really tough um finding a good team and understanding what you're not good at um and and then bringing in people that can support the areas where you're not so good i think is is key to that um so being aware of where you uh where your weaknesses are and, and who you can delegate to. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing some more delegating uh, with the <laughs> investment money as well. Um, yeah, I think, I, think that, I think that's key really for, for resilience and, and believing in your product. So, um, you know, there, there's, uh, it, it's not uncommon for people to uh, assume that our product is no good because it's in a can, which really makes no sense. <laughs> Most wine is produced in stainless steel tanks. Uh, and then it's only bottled right at the very end before you drink it. So um, there's no real reason why it, why it wouldn't be good. Uh, but you face that feedback all the time and you have to, you know, not get get put down by it. Um, and that is, you know, having having faith in the product. Um, yeah. And then further to the kind of the, the crop yield piece is probably our biggest long term supply chain uh, challenge. And it varies. We're, we're vintage led wine. So every year. We have a vintage on the wine and, and it is um, it's going to be different to the year before. So uh, that is a challenge because a lot of um, wine is, is blended to be uh, you know consistent year in, year out. Right. Uh, we're, we're leading on, on vintage, so there will be change. This year in France has been one of the worst harvests um, ever. So in, in April, there was a very, very bad frost, which destroyed about 30% of the crop. 
And then in summer, there were forest fires that destroyed another huge swathe of the south of France. So there's been huge issues from that and then northern Spain as well. Uh, and that's going to continue to, to happen and, and, uh, and probably get worse in some areas. And so where wine is grown and how it's produced, um, looking you know, to 2050, because it's a 25 year cycle on your vines, right. um, you, uh, you have to start making decisions probably 10 years ago, really, as to what you should be planting where. Mm. Um, which is not what we're doing. The wineries are doing that, but that is happening all over Europe. And obviously in the last 20 years, England's become much more of a, uh, a place to produce top quality wine as well because climate shifting northwards. Right. Uh, so, you know, where we source from and the grapes that we source, uh, the varieties that we source are all key in, in terms of the resilience. Mm. Um, yeah. So you've had to learn a lot really fast, haven't you? Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. I've learned a lot about viticulture and uh, and and wine, but just you know business generally, um, and and managing supply chains and and risk because there's risk at every single stage, right? Um, right, you know, right up until the product is is packaged uh, and and on a shelf. So um, minimizing that is is a challenge you know, yeah. all the time. I mean, I would assume that a lot of what keeps you going is, you know, you're a very strongly purpose-based business. I mean, the story you have to tell about the environmental cost of glass versus uh, aluminium, you know, is, is an incredible, it's an incredible argument and it's not one I'd come across before. So I can see that, you know, that gives you a very, I mean, I would imagine it would give you quite a strong motivation. Is that the main motivation behind the business, would you say? Uh, so it's around, um, similar to the, the taste, nutrition and planet, uh, we're about quality, accessibility and sustainability. There are three key things. So, um, you know, if you take a five pound bottle on a, on a supermarket shelf or, or five pound 67 is the average bottle sold in the UK, um, about three pound 50 of that is tax. Right. About a pound of that is the bottle and logistics. So there's not very much left for the wine. Wow. Um, so, uh, and bearing in mind, there's probably a 30%, 35% gross okay. profit on that for the, uh, for the supermarket as well. So there's very, very little left for the wine and then also for the vineyard and the people that work there and, and so on. So increasing the amount that people, um, or, or increasing the quality without people having to spend any more because our, our cans are priced at £5.50, so about the same price, just means that people can have something that's much, much better whilst reducing their environmental impact yeah. and, and just making it easier for people to have that. Because otherwise it would be a very expensive product. It would be 20 pounds in a bottle just because you're getting three times the amount. Um, so it's those three things, they're, they're, they're the keys, they're the, they're the drivers really behind the business um, and, and showcasing that. Right. Now, Victoria, I remember when we talked before, um, you talked about when you worked previously at Unilever and working on Dove, on the Dove brand. And in that, you know, clearly, again, the sense of purpose was quite a big motivator. I wonder if you could describe that a little bit for people. Absolutely. Um, so I had the, the privilege to work on Dove um, globally. And um, Dove is interesting. It's a brand that's um, been around for um, over 100 years. Um, functionally, it came from technology actually, which was um, a superior um, kind of washing technology. Um, but if you think about the beauty industry 20 years ago now, um, it, it all very much looked the same, right? Make skin softer, hair shinier, with the swoosh. And um, the portrayal of beauty globally was very singular. So you needed to have in some ways, um, in human proportions, right? Um, <laughs> and what Dove understood was that um, it was a huge anxiety. Um, you know, beauty should be a source of joy and happiness, but how you look um, was the opposite of increasing women's confidence. Um, it, it really drove um, women um, to feel bad about themselves. And so, there's two elements to Dove and um, Purpose that I personally found working for that brand um, very meaningful. One was to extend and widen the definition of beauty. Um, 
you know, the first time that Dove had real women on billboards in their underwear. Um, we have to bear in mind, you know, at the time, social media wasn't what it is. That was that was seminal. That, that had never been done before. And that extension of the kinds of women you saw in advertising um, on TV screens um, where to date it, it had been very narrow. You would never see anyone that looked like you, be that your shape, your um, your color, your dimensions. Um, so that was one element of, of democratizing beauty. And the other thing that Dove understood, and I had the privilege to lead um, the Dove Self-Esteem Project, which was to try and educate young girls because um, by the time women reach um, adulthood, in many ways, how they think about themselves, their, their view on beauty has already been ingrained. And actually, um, we have scientific, um, we had, uh, Dove had scientific evidence that showed that actually that kind of preteen tipping point was when girls started to really allow beauty to hold them back. So the way they looked would hold them back from sports, from engaging in school, from socializing. So the Dove Self-Esteem Project worked with institutional academic um, experts um, and educated um, young girls on body confidence. Um, uh, we'd educated just shy of 20 million young girls through the programs before I left. And um, I was able to commit the Dove Self-Esteem Project to um, commit to educating another 20 million. And so for me as a marketeer, um, being able to work on brands that can impact um, society, at scale um, for the better, you know, doing good business whilst doing good um, is, is hugely motivating and a great reason to get out of bed in the morning. Because if you're gonna spend um, more time at work than probably doing anything else in your life, then um, having that sense of, you know, why are you getting up and doing this? Well, to make a positive difference in the world. Um, and I've had the good fortune to work on you know, global brands with global scale to be able to do that um, at the scale of a Dove or, or of a Heinz and the work we do with um, also ensuring that kind of affordable food is um, going to the, the right people. We have a program um, in the UK with Heinz um, that we partner with Magic Breakfast. So during the pandemic, for example, we know that if kids aren't in school and um, for those who are um, able to get free school meals, they weren't able to access that provision so actually one of the first things we did um, just before the schools closed in the UK was to commit to 12 million breakfasts for all of those children that um, would would need that provision right so food insecurity and, and food poverty is a very real issue in the UK and in many other parts of the world it's not only a developing world issue um, it's actually in in many developed markets as well so those are the kinds of things for me that are purposeful, meaningful um, and having brands that can truly have that impact um, is, is very motivating. Yeah, I can imagine. And Simon, when you talk to potential new customers in your business, there's the story you can tell about the sustainability of your product. Does that make a big difference to them? Do they, do they even know those facts before you walk through the door? Uh, no, not normally before we walk through the door, uh, but yes, it does make a huge, uh, a huge difference. Um, so one of one of our largest customers to date um, is the National Trust. We've become their wine supplier, um, which is which is very exciting and Fantastic. rolling out across okay. the country. Um, but that, that's one of those customers which I don't think would have happened if it weren't for the pandemic, because they wouldn't have closed their sites. They wouldn't have uh, looked at their food and drink offering and rethought about how how they do it. So um uh that that was really important but also what they were trying to do was improve their sustainability so moving away from um single serve plastic bottles or, or small glass bottles looking to increase the level of recyclability and also the quality of the products that they're offering um that is true also for for airlines or other kind of major customers that we're speaking to uh, but it's also just as true for we you know we have lots of customers in in cornwall for example where um, single-use plastics and, and glass near beaches is a major issue um, mm -hmm. and there to be honest some of our earliest adopters are people on, on coastal regions in the UK 
um, looking to, to offer an alternative that doesn't have that danger of broken glass if it's the beach or, or, or risk of plastic washing up in the seas. So um, yeah, it's, it's hugely important for almost all of our customers, absolutely. Yeah, I can imagine. I see and hear quite a lot of cynicism of these days with regard to the climate emergency. And of course, we have COP26 coming up and a lot of doubt about its capacity to get ahead of the crisis. How hopeful do you feel about the um, our progress towards a more sustainable world, Simon? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I do feel quite hopeful because I think um, you know, ultimately, I mean, governments need 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 to to get their their ducks in a row with regards to energy production and distribution, particularly. Um, but in terms of consumer preferences driving change, um, I think that's happening faster and faster, and and people are getting more knowledgeable, and yeah. therefore businesses have to become more sustainable and want to become more sustainable. So, I think there's a market driven. Uh, a trend towards sustainability that is happening and will happen and there are there are brands that that lead with sustainability as their absolutely most important uh, thing i was just served a facebook advert before this uh, call of some carbon negative beer for example um so it is it is important it is hopeful and i think it will accelerate but there's a role that, that governments need to um need to take on and and I think, you know, following on from uh, COVID, you can see just how much governments can throw at things if they yeah, if they have the will to do it. Um, yeah. So it can happen and, and I hope that it will. Yeah. Victoria, how optimistic do you feel about this? I mean, it, we've, you know, for so long, both governments and, you know, large companies have done very little in response to the climate emergency. Do you think we've, you know, do you feel there's a sea change now? I think, I think there is. I think when you start seeing the types of challenges that climate change is bringing, and I read just this week that I think it was all 18 of the US intelligence agencies have put out climate change specific warnings um, due to some of the um, challenges that are likely to be up and coming in the US. So when you start seeing um, market forces, consumer behavior, consumer understanding, driving towards companies and brands that are willing to make that change, um, economic necessity. So when you look at the adoption of something like renewable energy and solar for many years was not economically viable because the panels were too expensive and, and you needed that um, you needed that scale and that tipping point. And if you look at markets like China, that for energy security embraced solar, um, I do believe that China has one of the most advanced solar um, provisions there. I think electric cars, again, if you look at um, not only the uptake of that, but being able to do that in a way that doesn't trade off a consumer experience. Because mm -hmm. for companies, it's it's making sure that the product, whatever that may be, whether that's an electric car that still needs to look stylish, right? Or plant-based food that needs to have the taste and the texture of right. a burger or a meat that consumers are used to. The minute you're able to do that, you get that market pull. Mm -hmm. I think economic pressures because of energy, because of water, because all the things we're talking about at the moment in terms of the supply chain challenges, means that companies are looking for more sustainable, um, perhaps more long-term economic ways. And then um, I do believe that regulation um, increasingly will play a role, um, whether that's through taxes or whether that's through government intervention um, in things like energy use in, um, in foods, for example, in um, putting regulations around um, sugar and salt reduction. So by no means is it perfect, but I, I, I do believe that meaningful change has been made, will continue to be made. I think the challenge will be if, you know, through those forces, we're, we're able to do that fast enough, given what does as a, as a, as a person increasingly feel um, quite immediate in terms of the need. Um, 
but absolutely hopeful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I know what you mean. It does. It does feel <clears throat> for a long time. It felt like it was a long way off and now it feels like it's now, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here is an impossible question for both of you. Um, if you look to about 10 years ahead, thinking of urgency, what do you imagine? I'm not asking you to predict, but what do you imagine the world of food and drink will look like for all of us? Simon, do you want to take the first crack at that? Uh, well, I, I think it will be more local. Uh, I know Victoria have already said that food is local, but, um, but even more local, I think. Um, vertical farming and things like that will, will open up doors to producing um, you know, within cities, food that can be served to those cities, for example. Um, so I think that will be a, a, a key, a key driver as well as um, provenance and a greater understanding of the supply chain generally. Um, yeah. So I think they're kind of two key drivers that we see in 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 wine, but that I, as a consumer, am very you know kind of keen on generally. Um, yeah. Although it's a very good point that you raised around whether there's a high energy usage. Um, for locally produced tomatoes versus tomatoes from Spain, for example. Um, so <laughs> I will pay more attention to that. Um, but uh, I think that's that. That's going to be key, um, which probably means a reduction in choice, um, or that uh, foods from with a higher, you know, energy intensive, um, either production or shipping will will be taxed or increase in, in cost relative to yeah. to local produce. Um, and I think that's that's true of wine as well. I think it's yeah. quite hard to justify drinking New Zealand wine uh, in the UK, for example. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And I suspect you're right that, you know, provenance is going to become more and more critical. Yeah. Victoria, what do you imagine we're all going to be eating and drinking 10 years from now? Apart, obviously, we're going to be drinking Simon's wine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I really hope we're still drinking wine. <laughs> um, yeah, I do too. <laughs> I um I think food will become increasingly personalized mm -hmm. uh, and I think the advances in kind of medical technology and food technology will intertwine um and so food that's designed for you as an individual um will it will increasingly become commonplace mm -hmm. um I think how it's produced as Simon said um technology advances in hydroponics in um certainly in the in the plant-based um the um mimicry of dairy of meats of things like that will change the energy and the ingredients that are used to produce foods if you will um and the waste associated mm. um you know the amount of waste that's in the food supply chain is incredible there are companies that now we're looking to use their food waste or their fruit waste as an example to drive um, revenue streams in um, fruit oils, in fibers, uh, banana fibers as an example being used as a substitute for wood. So I think the supply chain will look dramatically different. And then in terms of who consumes food and what's consumed, um, the other thing that for me is, is quite, an interesting phenomenon is when you think of the notion that food used to be three meals a day, right? People talked about breakfast, mm -hmm. lunch, and dinner. This snackification or this um, um, always on approach to food. Mm -hmm. I don't think that how we define food today, whether that's, you know, this is a, this is a thing that you eat for breakfast or only for right. breakfast. If you think about cereals, Again, personal pandemic eating habits, but um, together with beans on toast, I, I highly recommend <laughs> you know a, a beans on toast and cereals. You can you can pretty much eat across all three meal <laughs> occasions. Um, right. But that real kind of um, the the notion of a meal, I think the functional definition of breakfast, lunch, and dinner will go. I think. Mm -hmm the emotional elements of food. So whether that's food for fuel or, you know, there are cultures where food is absolutely seen as food as love or food as connection. Right. So I think those elements um, 
that are culturally binding will stay, but the functionality of when we eat and what we understand to be a meal at an appropriate time, I think all of that, um, you know, will change and be up for grabs. I mean, it used to be, um, you know, wine would be with an evening meal, right? Um, I'm sure Simon, as a, as a National Trust member, the next time I go, I absolutely will, will, will <laughs> check do. out the canned wines, but, um, you know, taking two kids and the dogs around a national trust property it's just so beautiful like why why can't you sit down the kids have hot chocolate and and a nice mm -hmm. wine in a can on on the banks of a beautiful lake on a on a national trust property somewhere so that behavior change and that shifting i think will be as as pronounced as some of the changes in how food is produced and what the supply chain looks like mm -hmm. yeah I must say, I find the um, elimination of meals a little frightening just from a social perspective, but it's very clear that that is a very, very big trend. One very, very quick question, question quick answers from both of you just before we wind up. Um, and I'll start with you, Victoria. What is the most hopeful thing you're seeing in the food marketplace at the moment? The mass adoption of plant-based eating. The impact that will have on the planet is huge. And for you, Simon? Um, I think it's that uh, sustainability is is part of the decision making process now for for everyone, um, as far as we can see. So it, it used to be something that was left in the background, but it's absolutely yeah. at the forefront of people's decisions. Yeah, and it's definitely not going to go away. <laughs> yes. Clearly a lot more to say on all of these subjects, and I hope we can explore some of them in the next webinars that I'll be uh, hosting next year. Next month should be a real treat, talking to one of Britain's leading businessmen, Justin King, former chief executive of Sainsbury's and also now chair of Made by Sport, an organization dedicated to supporting and developing grassroots sports. What's the relationship between sport and business? Uh, why do we always use sports analogies in business? Does that really matter? Or does understanding or doing sport help you any better at business? I hope you can join me for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much to Victoria and to Simon for sharing your work and your ambition with us here today. Thanks so much to everybody for joining. Thanks and goodbye. Mm -hmm.